100 years ago, on June 18, 1898, the Canadian Mining Institute was officially incorporated by an Act of Parliament of Canada. The Institute's origins lay in the provincial mining associations formed a few years earlier to promote the interests of Canada's mining and metallurgical industries. The guiding force that led to the establishment of these provincial mining associations and the Canadian Mining Institute itself was Benjamin Taylor A. Bell. As the Institute's first secretary, he played a crucial role in guiding the Institute through its formative years until his tragic death in 1904. The Institute's first president and founding member was John E. Hardman. Hardman, a distinguished mining engineer, mine operator, and a former president of the Mining Society of Nova Scotia. The Institute rapidly expanded under the leadership of the early presidents. In 1902, the first branches were founded in Sherbrooke, Quebec, Kingston, Ontario, and Nelson, British Columbia. The Institute's first decade was also one of continuing growth in the mining and metallurgical industry. The discovery of silver at cobalt in 1903 heralded the vast mineral resources of the Precambrian Shield. The first Canadian production of aluminum and the world's first electrolytic lead refinery marked Canada's emergence as a technological leader. The years up to World War I saw many major mineral discoveries in the Precambrian Shield. Notable presidents during this period were Willett Miller, the first Ontario provincial geologist, and Frank Dawson Adams, one of Canada's most eminent geologists. By the close of the decade, the establishment of the Institute's first specialized technical groups were already underway. In the 1920s, the Institute officially became the Canadian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. This name change recognized the Institute's wider mandate and the important role that metallurgists had played from its earliest days. Once again, the Canadian minerals industry was enjoying a banner decade with the discovery of the Sherrett Gordon Copper Zinc Deposit in Manitoba, gold at Red Lake, Ontario, and the Noranda Copper Deposit in Quebec. Alcan started its first production of aluminum at Arvida and Cominco had discovered the technological secret to efficiently treating ore from its giant Sullivan lead zinc deposit. As Canada emerged as a major world producer of metals and minerals, the Institute hosted the Second Empire Mining and Metallurgical Congress in 1927. With the collapse of the stock market in 1929, the price of copper hit an all-time low, but a rise in the price of gold stimulated a boom in gold mining camps across Canada. Among the Institute's presidents during this time was Selwyn Blaylock, an outstanding Cominco metallurgist and executive, member of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, and a trailblazer in human and industrial relations in the mining industry. With the outbreak of the Second World War, Canada's minerals industry focused on producing metals and minerals vital to the war effort. The Institute's 34th president, George Bateman, was appointed metals controller and played a key role in organizing Canada's wartime production. This decade witnessed the development of Canada's vast iron ore resources. First, at Steep Rock Lake in 1943, and then in the Labrador Trough, beginning in 1947. In Alberta, the famous Leduc No. 1 oil well was blown in, sparking Canada's post-war oil boom. The 1940s marked a pivotal decade for the Institute. The Industrial Minerals Division was formed in 1940, followed by the Coal Division in 1944 the Metallurgy Division and the Geology Division in 1945, and the Metal Mining Division in 1946. With these strong technical divisions to support and complement the many branches across Canada, the Institute was well positioned to serve a rapidly growing membership. At the beginning of CIM's sixth decade, Newfoundland joined Confederation. The 1950s were boom times for Canada's minerals industry. Discoveries of uranium at Beaver Lodge Lake, Saskatchewan, and Elliott Lake, Ontario, marked Canada's entry into the nuclear age. Major base metal discoveries were made at Bathurst, Manitowage Lake, Thompson, and Matagami Lake. The Institute also formed its sixth technical division, the Oil and Natural Gas Division, and hosted the sixth Commonwealth Mining and Metallurgical Congress. The Institute's leaders during this period included three members of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, Randolph Diamond of Cominco, A.O. Dufresne, Deputy Minister of Mines for Quebec, and Horace Fraser of Falconbridge. In a decade marked by social upheaval and space exploration, Canada's minerals industry continued to grow. In 1961, the Institute formed the Mechanical Electrical Division, later called the Maintenance Engineering Division. Two of the Institute's most successful divisions were later renamed the Petroleum Society of CIM and the Metallurgical Society of CIM. By the mid-1960s, the Institute's list of members had risen to 7,000. Among the Institute's presidents was another member of the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. John Bradfield, president of Noranda. The 1970s saw the development of large, open-cast coal mining operations in Alberta and British Columbia. 
The Institute established the Canadian Mining and Metallurgical Foundation to support continuing education activities and formed the Computer Applications and Process Control Committee. A notable Institute president was James Harrison, who provided outstanding leadership to the Geological Survey of Canada. In 1974, CIM hosted the 10th Commonwealth Mining and Metallurgical Congress. By this time, the Institute's membership had reached 10,000 strong. In the 1980s, there were many new milestones. The first production of crude oil from the tar sands at Fort McMurray. The world's most northerly metal mine, Polaris, and the discovery of gold at Hemlo. A severe recession forced the mining industry to begin the tasks of cost reduction and productivity improvement while developing greater environmental stewardship. In order to respond to these new realities, CIM formed a Human Resources Committee and an Environmental Committee, and the Institute welcomed the Canadian Mineral Processors as its ninth technical division. In this, the final decade of the 20th century, new chapters are being written in the history of Canada's minerals industry. With the discovery of diamonds in the Northwest Territories and of nickel at Boise's Bay, the minerals industry has become a high-tech industry employing methods and techniques that would astound its early pioneers. The 1990s also marked the name change of the Institute to the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum. Two new technical societies were created, the Geological Society of CIM and the Mineral Economic Society of CIM, and the environmental policy was adopted. Since its founding in 1898, CIM has become the leading technical society of all professionals associated with Canada's minerals, metals, materials and energy industries and proudly boasts 12,000 members. CIM is looking towards the millennium and its challenges for the future which will be competitiveness, globalization and sustainable development along with new and emerging technologies. CIM strives to be the association of choice. Its mission is to provide leadership, quality services and value to its members through the dissemination of knowledge, networking opportunities, continuing education and the recognition of excellence. 1998 marks CIM's centennial year. In the spirit of this auspicious occasion, we will reunite in the city of its founding, Montreal, to celebrate this momentous event. Come join us in our retrospective, recognizing CIM's 100 years of excellence and the outstanding accomplishments of Canada's minerals industry. We look forward to seeing you in Montreal.